Welcome to the Citizens Report. It's the 30th of July. I'm Robert Barwick, and I'm joined today by Citizens Party Executive Member Jeremy Beck. Welcome, Jeremy. Thanks, Robbie. In this week's Citizens Report, Australians embrace economic survival solution, where we're going to talk about the postal bank idea and the support that's building for it around Australia and what might happen in Parliament in the next few weeks, so stay tuned for that. And two, what did China and Assange reveal about Australia's sovereignty. We're going to use those two examples of issues to show that when it comes to those questions, the Australian government does not make sovereign decisions. And it's quite an outrage and people should be outraged about and act on it. So let's get into it. Before we begin, um, once again, we ask people if you like this show, please show it by hitting the like button. We also need you to share it and subscribe to this to our channel so that we can build the support for the uh, getting the information out this way and when you do subscribe make sure you click the bell icon so you can receive notifications for when the when new content it's not just this weekly show but other things we do such as citizens insight and there's some sh breaking shorts that we put up um, when new content appears you can be notified by that on, on your phone or wherever you get it um, and and then finally we have in the top right hand corner of the screen, if you point at that, there's a little eye icon. So when we reference something on the show and we tell you there's, you can look for that, that's available on our website, etc. for more information, you can click on that and get the link for that. All right, so that's how to navigate um, what, when we go through this information. Um, one of those things you can click on is, uh, if you have never see, received a free copy of our Australian Alert Service before, it's available there. You can also click on the information to subscribe to it. What we go through in the show is elaborated in more detail in our weekly magazine, the Australian Alert Service. All right, so have a quick look at that link and you can uh, get a copy if you haven't had one already. All right, Jeremy, let's get into it. Australians embrace economic survival solution. Um, I want to make an announcement first, which uh, we, uh, we forgot to announce last week. The Citizens Party is supporting a call by the victims of Stirling First. And that's, the, that's the, um, the scandal in Western Australia. And it's all around Australia, but it's concentrated in Western Australia, where there's 140 pensioners face being evicted from their homes because they were lured into a scheme by um, financial schemers who, frankly, one, ASIC shouldn't have allowed to, to run the scheme in the first place because of their track record. And two, ASIC didn't warn them about that, right? And so they face being they face ruin over that. It's a it's a scandal in its own right, but it's also a scandal about ASIC, the regulator. And two and a half years after the Royal Commission ended, it may as well not have happened. And we need an, an inquiry in Parliament using the Sterling First as a case, but a broader inquiry into what the government intends to do post the Royal Commission into cleaning up the financial system. Because if if Australian citizens just just Put your mind back to 2018. It was pretty dramatic what was coming out of that um, commission every month, yep. right? And if everything we heard means nothing's going to be done, then you're talking about the biggest cover-up of all time. Well, right? you wonder why the Royal Commission happened when you consider these victims. I mean, you hear the personal stories that yep. lost their home. The landlord's also been screwed over because he's been sucked in the same Ponzi scheme. Yep. Uh, no, it's, it's criminal and an ASIC just doesn't want to know about it. So the you know examining the case examining the scandal means you can d you can deal with with that case, but examining ASIC, ASIC is about making sure it doesn't happen again, right? And with it, so far there's no intention of the government to do that. We need an inquiry. So we've put that up on our on our website. There's, you can click on that um, and help us make calls to politicians because you know really put put pressure on them. We need to demand that inquiry. All right, now, the real thing we wanted to talk about, Jeremy, is what's coming up in Parliament in the next couple of weeks. The independent member for Kennedy, Bob Catter, in plans to introduce the bill for a postal bank, Commonwealth Postal Savings Bank. Now, it's a plan because he fully supports it um, and is prepared to do it, but uh, when more information comes to light, we'll report it, except there's a rule that's stopping him from doing it, and he's got to fight with them to get past that rule to be able to do it, right? We won't, I've, I've described it in the past, we don't have time to talk about it here now. Um, so look out for that happening. We will, we will publicise it as it happens. But that bill represents what the headline of this segment's about. A postal bank is a matter of survival. 
and it's not the only one, but we're going to, we'll talk about that, the postal bank part in, in a minute. So in this week's alert service, we have a, an excellent article by Melissa Harrison, Bank Regulators Shielding Big Four from Scrutiny Over Regional Branch Closures. And Melissa's looked at the work of this, um, this new independent online news service called The Regional. Elisa Barwick talked about it last week on the show, um, which has gone and done a, a detailed study into bank branch closures in Australia. Because in 1975, we had about um, close to 3,000 bank branches in regional Australia. Today, we've got 1,100. But the population of regional Australia is bigger than in 1975, right? Um, the banks have no interest in serving regional Australia whatsoever. And the problem is we've got four big banks that dominate the whole system, right? And so whatever they, decisions they make for their, you know, based on their profit motive, they don't care if regional Australia misses out, right? Um, bank branches being closed all over the place. There's been a whole bunch of bank branches closed in the last few years. And um, I, was, I was looking at a Facebook post earlier today that I was sharing with people like Jeremy. Uh, you know, up in North Queensland, in places like uh, Maria and Mariba and Cloncurry, et cetera, they, they're closing the bank. Like if, and if, if, it's a, if, if, the, if the only bank in town, Jeremy, is ANZ, mm. and ANZ closes and takes out its ATM, then those people in that town can't even use the Australia Post mm -hmm. because ANZ is not part of Bank at Post, right? Um, now, so this is people in these towns that are losing their banking services. They face these long, long drives to the next major centre to be able to do their banking, and that's what. I, and, and, it, and it's the beginning of the end for the town actually, because people then decide, well, if I've got to go there and do my banking, I'm do my shopping, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and, and it's you know the whole thing um, caves in on itself. Actually, there was to, to be specific, there was 2,802 branches in 1975, 1,107 today. Um, the this. Uh, problem of this collapse of services in regional Australia must be turned around. Now, there's a myth though that the banks use as an excuse partly when they pull out an ATM. They say, oh, Australians don't, aren't using cash anymore, right? <laughs> what happens when you have a, a major crisis, an electronic failure, uh, we, we just meant to not be able to transact anywhere? It does yep. not make any sense. Uh, cash is king, particularly in those regional areas. It, well, that's right, yeah. particularly in regional yeah. areas. <laughs> Yeah, we've got all this fancy 5G enabled communications infrastructure in big cities. You can mm -hmm. wave your plastic around or your phone or whatever. Mm -hmm. We're talking about in the bush. Cash is king anyway, culturally. Plus, that's where the technology is most unreliable. So when the banks are using that as an excuse to shut down their branches, or the latest decision is they've actually, um, in, in places where they have branches, they're halving the business hours. You can only bank there in the morning because oh, there's no demand. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's what board, uh, d boards in Sydney and Melbourne are coming up with as an excuse, right, to pare down their costs because they aren't committed to, the, to the, uh, the customer anymore. And that is why breaking news this week is the Narrabri Council in northern New South Wales has endorsed the Commonwealth Postal Savings Bank resolution. Now, this is a resolution that, that the Citizens Party initiated Supporters are taking it to councils all around Australia saying you should pass this and endorse it to support getting this bill. That This is the bill that Bob Catt is going to introduce, get it introduced. I want to read out, Jeremy, the rationale because it's, this, is, this is why the Narrabri Council has supported this motion um, and their rationale speaks for itself. Let me just read it out. Quote, as councillors would be aware, we war, if I'm saying that right, <laughs> um, <laughs> W -E -W -A, we will, I think, has recently lost both banks and their services. This has disadvantaged many people and businesses and charity groups in town. Businesses have had to allow an employee to travel to Narrabri to do business banking. This involves one to two hours of lost time. Businesses need to bank daily takings and or access cash to service customers in their shopping. Not everyone uses FPOS cards. Charities do not have local access for cash for functions, and these functions run on cash, i.e. raffles, street stalls, stalls, Christmas carnival, etc. A Commonwealth Postal Savings Bank would ensure these services that are so important to the smooth functioning of a community. The present arrangement between the National Australia Bank and Commonwealth Banks can cha change at the bank's whim, and that means the, arrange the arrangement they have with Bank at Post. Already, 
charges for transactions at Bank at Post that these big two big banks charge have increased to four dollars fifty. Mm. That's what you pay to use Bank at Post in Narrabri in WeWar. The situation in WeWar is exacerbated by the removal of the town's ATM. FPOS is available for limited cash at IGA and the bowling club if you are a member. When the internet went down last week for three days, people could not access their money and businesses could not service cards or cash outs. So this is this is why people are supporting this policy, right? Anyway, so just be clear, click on the click on the information link. That can take you to our instructions for how you can get involved in this campaign. You can get the resolution in the flyer that we've got. You get involved too. Take it to your council or you'll download it, email it to your councils in your area. We're doing, we're, it doesn't matter if you're in the cities, in the bush, email it to everybody. They all get it. Banks even shut down um, branches and, and ATMs in, in, in suburbs in the capital cities that they consider marginal, mm -hmm. right? And then, and then that's all taken. And the assumption is that oh, people will just use cards. No, cash is very important under all circumstances and this is something that you can practically get, in help, get involved with. The more resolutions we have, the more support there will be for what Bob Catter is going to do in Parliament around this bill. Um, but JB, a postal bank isn't just about local community surviving. It's a first step to a national banking system, including a national infrastructure bank, a development bank, that can invest in the neglected infrastructure the whole nation needs to survive. You've got to go back to 1911 when the Commonwealth Bank was first founded by King O'Malley and headed up by Sir Dennis and Miller. I mean, we, we had a, a bank that was a government bank for the common good, not, not for private profit, but to invest in the nation. And King O'Malley's vision was to invest in great infrastructure projects. I mean, we, we built the Trans-Australia Railway. We did all sorts of great things. We built the Snowy Mountain Scheme. And if we had a national development bank, we could invest in all sorts of things like the Bradfield Scheme, the Iron Boomerang. Yep. The Iron Boomerang is a railway line right across the top of Australia, which could be a major steel manufacturing hub. And both in Queensland and in Western Australia. These things need investment. Now, we're not going to get that from foreign investment. No. The way it's going now, you've got Mark Carney there is, is uh, heading up the United Nations push for zero net carbon. They don't want to invest in infrastructure projects that and are going industry. to produce emissions. Yeah. Uh, they will invest in speculation, but we need investment in real productive industries. So a national development bank will do that. And a postal bank is a foot in the door towards a full-on national development bank. No, oh, exactly. Without which this country isn't going to survive because economically we are in a decay phase that began 40 years ago and we're, we're often, every, every disaster that comes up, we're paying for it. Um, all right, so like I said, let's get involved in this campaign with this resolution, right? With the, just as the Narrabri Council saw it was a no-brainer, many, many others as well, um, including in regional Australia, we'll see it as a no-brainer. Get them to act on that because that's a huge voice to Parliament and we could actually get this bill passed. Um, all right, Jeremy, let's move on to our second subject, which is uh, just as serious. What do China and Assange reveal about Australia's sovereignty? And um, I'm glad you mentioned the Iron Boomerang because we might talk about that again in a second. <laughs> so... Regular viewers of the show would know that we are very, very concerned about the drumbeats of war. There's a, there's a, there is an intention to trigger, instigate a war against China. And Australians have been fooled into believing that China is the instigator, and it is not. And before I give, I just have to make, give an example of that. The, one of the voices in Parliament, um, uh, Senator Jim Molan, former general, who keeps warning about the war, he warns that Australia is not can't defend itself from this war. And he said it again the other day. When China attacks us, um, we're going to be defenceless. And his, excuse, his reasoning was this, because we rely on our ally America, and this is what he said. Now think about the logic of this. We rely on our ally America, and it's stretched thin all around the world. He said China only has to worry about the South China Sea and the East China Sea. People, by definition, that means China does, everything China does is defensive. Yeah. It's more worried about us invading them, then we ever have to worry about China invading us. It doesn't have a history of doing that. You uh, don't see um, Chinese warships in uh, the Gulf of Mexico or Hudson Bay or uh, circling around the United States like US warships are circling around China. All the British ones just come <laughs> yeah, over, yeah. right? No, you don't see that. 
they send a spy, they, they have these attack China drills in Northern Territory, and so the Chinese do send a spy ship down just to keep an eye on that, and that's, we act like that's an invasion, right? Anyway, like it or lump it, agree with that or not, um, that's the way we see it. It's a very serious problem. Um, but people are talking ourselves into this, and it's getting to an insane frenzy because it's becoming normalised. So I want, to, I want to play an interview, three minutes of an interview that was done this week between National Party Senator Matt Canavan, who's one of these voices, unfortunately, and Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon was Donald Trump's advisor, a person I regard as a racist, xenophobic fraud. And the fraud part is because one of the reasons people supported Donald Trump, including us originally, is he said, I don't want permanent war, right? But then he went and employed a guy named Steve Bannon, and the act of Trump employing, not Steve Bannon, uh, John Bolton. The act of Donald Trump employing John Bolton as his um, advisor, national security advisor, destroyed every anti-war statement he made because there's probably no, no single greater, great, greater warmonger in the world than, than John Bolton, who should be in jail for the lies he told to get the Iraq war started, mm -hmm. right? And Trump employed him. And... John Bolton is someone that Steve Bannon, when he ran his Breitbart radio channel, used to give a regular weekly show to, right? There's no way Steve Bannon's anti-war. And Steve Bannon, watch this clip, Steve Bannon is trying to whip up war from America against China, and he's asking if Australia's going to be involved. Listen to how Matt Canavan answers this, and pay attention to what Matt Canavan says on economic matters. Matt. Canavan. So, Senator, Australia has been such a great ally of the United States and such an integral part of, of the Western alliance. Uh, we have talked, and I've talked for years now, having been a naval officer in the South China Sea, that when war comes, if a kinetic war comes, if we don't stop them on the information and cyber war, if we don't stop them in this economic war, if we don't stop them in their infiltration, this will, will slide into a kinetic war. That will happen in the South China Sea. Are the Australian people prepared, even more than India and Japan or other allies, you are the frontline nation around at the South China Sea. Will Australia be there for the West if it actually, if it actually we slide into a kinetic war? Well, none of us, Steve, here in Australia want, to, want war. We've never been a country that's been aggressive to other nations, but we've always, as you've said, been a country that's when, when the call's gone out, we've responded. I think we've fought in every war uh, with the United States uh, since since World War One, uh, we celebrated 100 years of that alliance uh, a few years ago. Uh, so you can count and trust, and particularly on the Australian people. Uh, I mean, the Australian people are almost 100% united uh, on seeking to reduce our dependence on China. They've seen the real face of the Chinese Communist Party. So there's a poll out early this year where where 90% of Australians agreed with the the statement that we should reduce our relationship with China, 90%, uh, not, not even 90% of people support democracy. You know, there's always 20% of people who oppose something. This is, this is, this unites Australians like no other issue. Our problem in our society, though, is there remains a fifth column. Uh, there remains a fifth column among us. Uh, they're in that 10%, percent let be less than that. Uh, they're in our senior parts of our bureaucracy, senior elements of an elite sections of our corporate sector, who have become addicted with the easy money uh, from the Chinese Communist Party. The Chinese Communist Party are very good at, uh, at, at pinpointing the weak spots uh, in our societies and communities. And yes, there are a lot of business people whose bonuses, whose share prices are now inextricably linked uh, with the Chinese Communist Party. And so we need to find a way to get out of that. Uh, what I think we should do is make sure we develop supply chains that cut out China. Uh, we, we've got to do that together, even now, before any of this happens. We should be working together so that China doesn't produce 60% of the world's steel. You know, we've got the iron ore and coking coal here. I'd love to send it to someone else to make steel. Let's do that. We've got to make sure China doesn't control 80% of the world's rare earth supplies. Uh, we have the largest rare earth uh, producer outside of China uh, here in Australia. Uh, so we've got to work together uh, to cut China out because China has, in the last couple of decades, since we let them join the WTO, they have secured the commanding heights of the industrial economy. Uh, but we're to get to get out of that, we've got to work together uh, to restore some some balance to, to world trade and investment. How nuts is that? Crazy. I mean, what do they want? 
World War Three thermonuclear Armageddon. I mean, we we haven't had any success at all in in Afghanistan. What what do you think? Taking on China, uh, it's just nuts. And and on the economic side, <laughs> Matt Canavan who says tokenly, oh, Australians don't want war, but 90% of us are there with you all the way, America, on your war, right? We, we, we never shirk a war. Australia is never, never the aggressor. Tell the Iraqis Australia is never the aggressor, Matt. They didn't do anything to us. We did it to them. So stop kidding yourself. But then, Matt Canavan, if you're the one who wants us to fight a war, why don't you want the industry that we'll need to fight the war? Oh, we don't want China making our steel. We're happy to send our iron ore and coal to some other country to make our steel. <laughs> Jeremy, what's wrong he's, with making our steel here? Well, he's forgotten the point that China's the biggest world economy in terms of you know, manufacturing and building all this infrastructure that needs the steel. And of course, well, we could use the steel here in Australia too. So the iron boomerang could be a win-win in terms of selling the steel to China so that they can build the infrastructure and we can use a lot of that steel and build our infrastructure. Because specifically iron boomerang yeah. means we make, what's the, it's called the, the, the first pass of steel here. Yeah. And we send the steel to China or mm -hmm. other countries to be made into something else. But we yeah. can go back to making our own steel again. Yeah. Right? Matt Canavan wants to represent the coal fields of Queensland. He claims that you know, he's the first guy to, to take on the climate change alarmists that is trying to shut down the coal industry, right? But where does that coal go? It goes to China he wants to start a war with. That's doing a, more immediate damage to the coal market than the climate change people are. And he still doesn't want industry in Australia. Unfortunately, this is the difference between, if I can make an editorial comment, Jeremy, the difference between a Matt Canavan and the National Party and Bob Catter. Bob Catter quit that party 20 years ago because they went along and actually went further in most cases than the Liberals in free trade nuttery and mm. sold our industries down the river. Mm. And now they're talking about, oh, we need industry, we need more better supply chains, etc. in the context of this stupid war with China they want, yet they're not, by his own admission, they're not even really committed to the industry we need. Oh, exactly right. And, and China's not just building infrastructure in China. China's helping other nations uplift their people out of poverty building infrastructure all over the world. Look at the infrastructure they're building in Africa. It's not a debt trap. It's actually lifting them out of poverty. Yeah. And, and they're going to need steel. We can make the steel. We can sell the steel. But we can also use it here in Australia to build our own infrastructure. Yeah, so you, if you haven't seen the Iron Boomerang um, explanation before, click on the link and you can get uh, that. I also urge people, we, we published in, um, a couple of, in a couple of weeks episode issues of this alert service, Jeremy, a very interesting discussion between two Singapore foreign policy experts, and Singapore is an Asian country Australia likes, but how they were talking about China, and it's, all Australians need to hear it because the alarmist nonsense we're getting here about China is not shared by a country, a little tiny country like Singapore, um, and you need to listen to these two experts. You can click on that and, and um, read, read the transcript of, of that discussion as well. So. Um, I want, to I want to point out something, Jeremy, about one of the things Matt Canavan said, though, which is why we, which is, we introduced the next subject here, or the next part of this. He referred to a fifth column, right? China's behind a fifth column. That means an infiltration here. And we've taken that on this week in a press release about McCarthyism in Australia. Now, let me preempt all the reactions I'm going to get. No, McCarthy was not a good guy. This is, there's been a right-wing whitewashing of McCarthy in the last 20 years. McCarthy was not a good guy. He was a tool of the elements in the CIA and British intelligence who wanted to create a Cold War. And that required whipping up all this alarmism in America. Those elements overlap the same elements that Dwight Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex. If you know that history, his last final speech as president, he warned against the military-industrial complex. And Dwight Eisenhower was the one who pulled McCarthy down. Because at a, you know, when McCarthy was ranting and raving and on his witch hunt against commies in the 50s, um, Dwight Eisenhower didn't say much. But when it got absolutely patently ridiculous, Dwight Eisenhower said, get rid of this guy, right? Because he started blaming, he started attacking generals who had led the army in World War II and all that. Everyone was a commie eventually. And it was just nuts. And, and we're seeing a similar thing here. Um, Australia has its own Senator McCarthy, and that's Senator James Patterson. Now, James Patterson... He's the 33-year-old chair of the most powerful committee 
in the parliament, which is the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. Um, there's a guy in the parliament, Jeremy, who is probably, he's up there with Australia's leading intelligence experts. He's a member of parliament. Andrew Wilkie. Andrew Wilkie. He's not just a member, he's not just an intelligence expert because mm -hmm. that was his background. He was, mm -hmm. he, he worked at the Office of National Assessments. Mm -hmm. He's a moral mm -hmm. intelligence expert. He's the guy that when he saw that they were lying yeah. in 2002 about weapons of mass destruction, he went public and resigned over it. He should be the chair of that committee. He should be the chair and, of that committee. And he's not even on the committee. He's not allowed to be on the committee. That's crazy. Labor and Liberal exclude all others from that yeah. committee. He should even be, he should at least be on the committee. He's not allowed to be on the committee. And so contrast that to the fact that the chair is this 34-year-old 33-year-old, what, what are James Patterson's qualifications? Well, he, ha he seems to have one, and that is he's a member of this thing called the Wolverines. And the Wolverines is this curiously juvenile pack of alarmist MPs in Parliament that are sinophobic. They're whipping up fear about China all the time. That's their job. But they claim they're fighting for sovereignty. And the, 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 mem the main members include Patterson, Andrew Hastie, Erica Betts, and Kimberly Kitching. And regular viewers of the show might recognise that name as well um, <laughs> from Australia, from the Australia Post fight. The the this 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 group of uh, Wolverines, their big thing is we're fighting for Australia's sovereignty from this Chinese infiltration. The infiltration comes from a professor named Clive Hamilton, a professor of ethics at Charles Sturt University. He wrote this book in 2018 called Silent Invasion, which was just a yellow peril book. And the yellow peril referring to, that's how Australians thought about China a hundred years ago. Oh, the yellow peril, are going to invade us. That's what this book was a dog whistle to, Silent Invasion. There's a, there's a section in that book where this professor, uh, uh, Hamilton, Clive Hamilton, he stated in that book, 30% of Chinese Australians, and the Chinese community in Australia is our biggest ethnic group. There's about a million of them, right? People of Chinese origin. 30% of, of Australians of Chinese origin he said, are more loyal to Beijing than to Australia. And what was the basis of that? What was his proof? None. It was a guesstimate that a friend of his made. I mean, he's a professor. His job is to do proper studies, come up with evidence, etc. right? That book has shaped in a large way this, that and, and this outfit called Australian Strategic Policy Institute, um, ASPE, which is funded by the US government. It's just shaped this paranoia in Australia that, that, that James Patterson, as the chair of this committee, is um, able to use his position to, to uh, go on a witch hunt against. Oh, it's foreign interference. It's foreign influence. Suddenly, you're hearing these terms everywhere all the time. Um, the reason we put out this release this week is because there's a, there was an incident where a member of the pu a, 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 a public servant who works at the parliamentary library named Jeff Wade he was exposed by a journalist, an independent journalist who used to work for SBS and Channel 7 named Marcus Rubenstein because Jeff Wade was supposedly working for the government in the parliamentary library and, but every five to ten minutes he would be sending out a tweet about members of the Chinese community in Australia and his suspicion that they were, they were, they were connected to the Chinese government in this way or the, the CCP, it's never the Chinese government, it's the Chinese Communist Party. They're connected to the Chinese Communist Party. They're connected to the Chinese Communist Party. And eventually he sent out a tweet about a Canberra language school, a Chinese language school in Canberra, where there's school kids and they're there to learn Chinese. Now, my, my daughter's best friend, who's her neighbour, is Indian. And she, on, on her weekends, this little Indian girl would go and learn Indian, right? So these are people who send their... They're growing up in Australia, but they want their kids to know Chinese as well. So they send them to a, they, they, they go to normal school and they go to a Chinese language school. He, pub, he published a photo of nine of these kids, eight of whom were Chinese origin. You could clearly identify them. He identified the school and he insinuated that somehow that's connected to a Chinese government influence operation. And Marcus Rubenstein exposed that and said, this is nuts. This is crazy and this is wrong to do this to kids. Mm -hmm. Wrong. And if you, the viewer, don't get that, that's your problem. It is wrong. This is such as the climate we have now. 
And I don't, I don't want to preempt the viewer, Jeremy, but we, get, we do get a bit of feedback on this subject, right? Well, it, it is mad. I mean, these are kids, what, what crime have they done? <laughs> no. <laughs> and, and, and putting it out for the world to see and, and their identities uh, and the school they're from, that, that is, it is wrong. It, how could anyone justify that? So what happened was when, this, when Marcus Rubenstein yeah. exposed it in an yeah. article, uh, it hit a nerve. Mm -hmm. Jeff Wade took down his tweet mm -hmm. and his boss at the parliamentary library told him to stop tweeting because that part was that was an issue as well. Why is he tweeting on his, in his work hours? He's supposed to be working at the parliamentary library. Why? This is not official business, surely. Or is it? Or is this the, what the Australian government does now? So they, they told him to stop tweeting. When James Patterson, Mr McCarthy, heard about that, in the Senate, in a, in a, in a Senate hearing, he attacked that expose of Jeff Wade as he said, I believe this is state-sponsored campaign against this public servant. In other words, the Chinese government's behind this. This is how far their reach extends. This is what we mean by McCarthyism. It is nuts. So what are these people like who are so concerned about this Chinese influence? What is their view of sovereignty? Jeremy, I want to highlight two things. This Wolverine pack that Patterson's part of, you know, and they go around these, li they leave these little stickers on the walls of Parliament. They're that juvenile. They've got stickers of claws. That's what the claws, the stickers are, claw marks. And they leave them on the walls of Parliament as, see, we're here. We're the Wolverines here. We're protecting your sovereignty. It's all about sovereignty, sovereignty, sovereignty. Last year, they made um, the US ambassador an honorary member of their pack. Which country, country is he from? The United States. Oh, not Australia. Not Australia. Oh, that, sovereignty. Yeah. What sort of definition of sovereignty is that? <laughs> Second one. James Patterson is the main front man in Australia, and Erica Betts is another one, that promotes this idea called CANZUC. It's a little-known idea. You might not have heard of it. But CANZUC stands for Canada, Australia, New Zealand, United Kingdom. And CANZUC is a, just a blatant attempt to revive the white part of the British Empire. They want to have a free movement, free trade zone. And then eventually, they would like to become a voting block at the UN. A voting block at the UN means those white countries, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, UK, would give up their independent foreign policy to be part of a collective at the UN. Sounds similar to the European Union. That they, they get rid of all their sovereignty of their individual <laughs> nations and just be part, part of some... Uh, Anglo-American uh, yeah, neocon warmongering establishment. It does sound similar to that, but also, but also yeah. because it does sound similar to that, um, James Patterson's at pains to say, no, no, it's not like the European Union, it's going to be different. I'll tell you what will be different about it. It's just, it just means it's the British Empire again. Mm -hmm. right? This system will be dominated by the United Kingdom and British intelligence and, of course, in lockstep with these neocons in the United States. This is not sovereignty. This is anti-sovereignty. Right? This is nuts. And it just we have to highlight this stuff because this is the these this these buzzwords they use like sovereignty are a fraud. And it's the it's it's all part and parcel of, of how they whipped us up to be to think that not only is a war with China acceptable instead of crazy, it's somehow necessary. All right, final thing, talking about sovereignty, because that's what this seg segment's about. Um, let's talk about Assange now, because there's breaking news about Julian Assange, and you probably haven't heard it yet in Australia unless you follow this stuff closely on social media. But, Jeremy, the United States government's case against Assange has effectively collapsed, hasn't it? Well, that's exactly right. You, you have a look at... There's two parts of, of the Get Julian Assange. Uh, there was the Espionage Act, and, and then there was the, the hacking charges. And the Espionage Act was, was always... Well, th there's no way you could justify that because that, that just goes against free speech. Because what Julian Assange was doing is exactly what journalists do. If, if they get some um, you know, whistleblower Leak. that comes in and, and leaks mm. some documents, well, well, they'll put it out there for the public to see for, in the public's interest. And, and, <laughs> and all the main American papers publish exactly the same stuff Julian well, they, Assange did. They did. They, they published the WikiLeaks material. So really... Uh, how could they do that? Because that goes against uh, the, the amendments and free speech in the United States Constitution. The problem is, uh, Julian Assange, he's an Australian citizen. He's not a, a citizen of the United States. So they thought they could get him on that. But that was always on shaky ground. But then you've got the, the idea of the, uh, the hacking, uh, you know, actually uh, hacking into computers and getting information. Because that and is a crime pretty much anywhere. Th that is a crime. Now, yep. uh, the case is very shaky because Chelsea Manning... Uh, help 
Julian Assange to, to get the material to WikiLeaks, but Julian Assange, he didn't hack into the computers. The, the United States prosecutors will make out that he did, but he didn't. Chelsea yeah. Manning provided Julian Assange and WikiLeaks with the documents. And she's so, already been jailed for what she did. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. But now uh, the, the United States tried to frame Julian Assange, this is several years ago in Iceland when WikiLeaks had their operations in Iceland. Uh, and they used this uh, Sigurda Thorvison, who is an absolute con man. Uh, he, he divulged material to the FBI that, uh, oh, uh, Assange is directing uh, hacking, hacking operations yeah. in, in Iceland, which is completely farcical because uh, Julian Assange had very good relations with, with the uh, Icelandic government there. Anyway, so uh, uh, the Sigurd of uh con man who, who got himself into WikiLeaks, uh, then, then it turns out that uh, he stole about $50,000 from, from WikiLeaks. Uh, he, he made out that he was some high position in WikiLeaks when he was only just basically a volunteer. And he has a pretty murky and past. And he has a very murky past. He's a serial pedophile. Uh, a con man full stop. But he, he told the FBI, and as a plane load of FBI agents that came in there to try and frame up Julian Assange, yeah. uh, you, you couldn't, you couldn't um, dream this story up. <laughs> uh, fr frame up Julian Assange. Now, fortunately, the, um, the Icelandic interior minister, he got wind of this and he shut it down. He said, go home, you're not wanted here. These FBI agents, you're, he knew that they were yeah. out to frame Julian Assange. But what's happened now is um, Sigurd Vaforvason, he, he said... Um, oh, well, actually, I, I effectively lied. <laughs> <laughs> Julian Assange wasn't hacking uh, the Icelandic um, authorities. Uh, so the main, complete... witness, the main witness for, their own, for the only part of their case against Assange that yeah. has any teeth yeah. has just uh, recanted. Yeah. Uh, so where is it? They've got the Espionage Act, which is against freedom of speech. There's nothing on him. So why does not Scott Morrison come out and say, look, Julian Assange, you're an Australian citizen, you, you've got to come home and pressure the United States and pressure the United Kingdom and say, look, Julian Assange has got to go come home. Why? Because obviously Scott Morrison doesn't care about sovereignty. No, they, they talk about it, but this, these, are the, these are the actions where this is where sovereignty matters. Yeah. Right? Um, Julian Assange never broke any Australian law. Yeah. Malcolm Turnbull said that before he became Prime Minister and then spent none of his time as Prime Minister doing anything about it either. Yeah. So he's not in breach of any Australian law. Yeah. He wasn't in the United States anyway. So yeah. this is America's extrajudicial reach. Yeah. They've cooked up a case. He's been in prison for over two years yeah. in Belmarsh, yeah. right? The, the case to extradite him, which is based on this, these charges... Mm. Was, was they lost in January. The, mm. the, the British judge ruled against it, right? Mm. So now they're waiting till next January, I believe, or December or something to appeal it. Mm. That keeps Julian Assange in prison needlessly for another 12 months. And now halfway through that the extra 12 months, the main witness has disappeared. What is Scott Morrison doing? Yeah, it, right? it's shameful. I mean, Julian Assange is exposed all these war crimes, uh, you know, are we really sovereign or are we just following along the Anglo-American warmongers? The people that, that's right, the people who want Australia to line up behind the push to war on China do not believe in our sovereignty. Get that through, we have to get that through our heads and stop this war drive. Now we've gone way over time, Jeremy, what we normally plan, but that's okay. The information was very important. So let me remind you again, um, if the earlier part of the show, get involved in the resolution campaign. Like I said, click on there for more information. Um, if you want the elaborated version of stuff of what we've just gone through today, it's in the alert service. You can click on that for that. So, Jeremy, we better call it a day. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, Robbie. And thanks to the viewer for tuning in. Tune in next week for more of the Citizens Report.